Within the last two decades, the Akashic Records have creeped into every aspect of media, slowly becoming more of a common concept, not only amid spiritual circles and publications. What exactly are these records? How do we access them? And where did this term even originate? We hope that you enjoy as we deep dive into the meaning of Akasha, but remember to always question any material we may present. The Akashic Records are a compendium of all events, thoughts, words, emotions, and intent ever to have occurred in the past, present, or future. They are believed to be encoded within a non-physical plane of existence known as the mental plane in theosophy. Akasha, or Akasa, is the Sanskrit word for aether, sky, or atmosphere. The Sanskrit term Akasha was brought to the Western world through none other than Helena Blavatsky, who introduced this concept to the language of theosophy in the late 1800s after her time studying in Tibet. Helena characterized Akasha as a sort of life force, and also referred to the term as indestructible tablets of the astral life, recording both the past and future of all thoughts and actions, but she did not use the term Akashic. The notion of Akashic records was first explored by later theosophists, like Alfred Percy Sinnott in his book Esoteric Buddhism, when he cites Henry Steele Alcott's A Buddhist Catechism. Alcott wrote that Buddha taught two things are eternal, Akasa and Nirvana. Everything has come out of Akasa in obedience to a law of motion inherent in it and passes away. No thing ever comes out of nothing. Alcott further explains that early Buddhism then clearly held to a permanency of records in the Akasa and the potential capacity of man to read the same when he was evoluted to the stage of true individual enlightenment. As the years went on, the association of the term with the idea was complete. In 1899, in Charles Webster Leadbeater's book Clairvoyance, he identified the Akashic records by name as something a clairvoyant could read. In 1927, Alice Bailey wrote in her book Light of the Soul, the Akashic record is like an immense photographic film, registering all the desires and earth experiences on our planet. Those who perceive it will see pictured thereon, the life experiences of every human being since time began, the reactions to experience of the entire animal kingdom, the aggregation of the thought forms of a karmic nature based on desire of every human unit throughout time. Herein lies the great deception of the records. Only a trained occultist can distinguish between actual experience and those astral pictures created by imagination and keen desire. Since the time of these theosophists, many have written on the subject of a collective unconscious that we all contribute our experiences towards and attain many of our instincts from. The term collective unconscious itself is coined by Carl Jung, a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. Jung described the human collective unconscious to be populated by instincts as well as archetypes and universal symbols, such as the great mother, the wise old man, the trickster, the shadow, the tree of life, and so on. Jung considered the collective unconscious to surround and underpin each unconscious mind, distinguishing it from the personal unconscious. He argued that this collective had profound influence on the lives of individuals who lived out its symbols and clothed them in meaning through their experiences. Jung founded analytical psychology, which is the psychotherapeutic practice revolving around examining the patient's relationship to the collective unconscious. We have also previously mentioned Dr. Rupert Sheldrake's morphic resonance theory in our very first video. A morphic resonance is the theory of a species gathering and depositing instinctual experience to a collective unconscious via morphogenetic fields. However, these are specific to their species, each human influenced by the human morphogenetic field and other species via fields of their own frequencies. If we peel back another layer, and consider what the collective unconscious of every soul in the universe would be, not just one species. That is the scope of what the realm of Akasha encapsulates. Every soul that exists and has ever existed. Akasha is a deep-rooted universal frequency and can be directly compared to Indra's net, the realm and record of each soul and the interactions between each. 
How exactly do these records work? And what is their function? Can we quote unquote read them? Imagine a library filled with shelves as far as the eye can see, each book on each shelf being the equivalent of one soul. Each of these books contains everything this soul will ever incarnate in, every incarnation, every version of that incarnation, and every alternate timeline, thought, and action within each of these. This is of course an allegory, but it'll help put the function of these records within an understandable frame. Speaking to our higher selves can be done in many ways, but ultimately we discern this communication by gaining answers to deep-rooted questions within ourselves that we either couldn't ask or answer before making this contact. Meditation is the most common practice for communing with your higher aspect, but there are many, many others, and it's an interesting experiment to test which methods work best for you. This communion with our souls is how we read our records and the records of our ancestors in the Akashic realm. When we take a look at Kelantic science, the mechanics match that of the Akashic. This body of work expands on Dr. Sheldrake's morphic resonance theory by explaining how morphogenetic fields are made, which we've somewhat covered in our last video on the indigos. When we consider what the next door neighbor of our physical first density is, and also densities beyond just the next on the ladder, we can begin to understand how the records are shaped, and how we are shaping them ourselves. Imagine the library allegory we mentioned earlier. To add higher densities to this model, let's consider the first floor as our first density, and the additional floors making up the higher densities. In our last video on the indigos, we also mentioned how DNA imprints delegate how many frequency bands we can incarnate through. Our ancestral human imprint is designed to reincarnate in the first four harmonic universes of density. So for every human soul, there will be one book on the first four floors. Your quote-unquote book on each floor would contain every possible timeline, thought, and action your soul has the potential to experience within each respective harmonic universe or density. So when new human souls are added to the shelves, this doesn't mean that they've already lived out everything on all four floors, but the potential of each exists as soon as the soul does. This implies that speaking to your higher aspects, or higher self, is speaking to your soul's potential. However, time is irrelevant within higher densities of matter, so a question arises. Why are we navigating ourselves towards becoming our higher selves if they have already made that journey? Is there a difference between potential timelines and what our point of awareness consciously traverses? Making any decision is like choosing an alternate timeline for yourself, flickering ourselves in and out of new potential. Therefore, the books change as we make new decisions. The timelines within each book on each floor are not set until our awareness has traversed them. The writing in the books continuously changes. Hence, it's inadvisable to look for anything but advice from this realm, as it is also where people retain their incarnational memory from, which having too much detail of can quickly alter your current lifetime if you focus too much on a past one or something that happened in it. Keep in mind that in our video on dimensions, we mentioned how they run in sets of 15, but there is no limit to the amount of sets. Therefore, there is no limit to the Akashic realm or the size of the library our local set of dimensions containing the morphogenetic memory of our local wing in the overall labyrinth. Discerning between pictures created by imagination and actual information coming through the Akashic, as Alice Bailey has written, requires practice and dedication. Just like training any other muscle, the more we do something, the more commonplace it begins to be. Is it possible that information from the Akashic realms sometimes bleeds into our thoughts and dreams, appearing to us as spontaneous thoughts and lucid realities. There is evidence of the collective unconscious being affected by the collective itself, the best example being that with the invention of color TV, our dreams actually gained color as well. Before the 1940s, it statistically measured that three quarters of the world dreamt in black and white, but many still do to this day. Did globally focusing massive amounts of attention to color TV passively teach us to apply more detail to our own dreams? 
Using comparative research, we can begin to form these new questions on the concept of the Akashic realm and the collective unconscious, as has been done in the past. The more angles we can approach a subject at, and the more people we have discussing these things, the more we'll be able to understand them. As always, links to books on today's subject can be found down below, and we hope you have an awesome day. Thank you for watching.